Well, hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, welcome to another version of our podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. We've got some exciting stuff we're going to be covering today. Be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification on youtube.com, or just Chris Voss. You can go to thecvpn.com to see all the eight podcasts that we have under the Chris Voss podcast network so be sure to check that out as well covering all the different aspects of some of the things we're going to be talking about today today we once again this is a reoccurring guest we have on the show i've heard that he wants a robe much like you know saturday night live gives you a reoccurring guest robe so we'll have to look into that for him we'll get his measurements uh it is gary shapiro Gary Shapiro is the president and CEO of the Consumer Technology Agency, or CTA, otherwise is known. Uh, they are the U.S. Trade Association, representing more than 2,200 consumer technology companies, which owns and produces CES Show. You may have heard of this giant show coming up next month. And he directs a staff of more than 160-plus employees and thousands of industry volunteers, leading organizations, promotion of Innovation is a national policy to spur the economy, create jobs, and cut the deficit. That sounds great to me. Welcome to the show again, Gary. Chris, I am so honored and happy to be here again with you. I'm honored to have you too. I love you, man. You we're good friends on Facebook. I love what you write most of the time. <laughs> uh, where you write really smart stuff on technology and everything else. And uh, I like to keep thought leaders around me. And uh, man, I don't know how you do it, Gary, every year pulling off CES. I mean, this is, this is a hell of a show. You know, I sometimes pinch myself. I'm very fortunate. Obviously, the 4,500 companies that exhibit are the stars of the show, and they each, every one of them brings their own thing and cool stuff to the show. Uh, we're just, we're just throwing a big party, essentially, and, and uh, they're the ones that come with all the gifts. That must be why I like to go to the CES show. It's just a giant party, Chris. Well, it's not a part, I, I, you know, I, Chris knows I just kicked out the PR yeah. person because now I can say what I want, but it's not a sure. party, obviously. It's a business yeah, event. We it's don't definitely a business. In. Yeah. And, uh, There's not know, drinking hard, and falling over or anything at CS show. It's definitely Well, what's going on right now is people are trying to balance their family and their holidays with the fact that they have deadlines to meet to get to CS. They're trying to get the product ready in time. They're trying to, you know, figure out finish off the collateral or anything they're doing, set up their meetings. It's an incredible time of year for people right now. And the CES itself, you know, it's looking great. You know, Las Vegas is uh, knock with always decent weather. Uh, the airlines are adding extra seats. Last show they added 20,000 extra seats just for CES, 10,000 domestically. They should just um, rename Las Vegas uh, the CTA show or the CES show during you guys' time there. You guys own that town. Uh, you know, it's interesting because, because, you know, I, the more I learn about it, the more interesting it is actually how people get there. So one of our opening keynoters is the uh, CEO of Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian. And the way he got familiar with us, he was, um, at the CS last year as a walk on to talk about what Delta's deal with IBM when Ginny Rometty, the CEO of IBM was keynoting. And he was so impressed with what he saw and the fact that Delta is a tech company. And we've been saying every company is a tech company. And did I, Look, I fly Delta twice a week, to be honest with you, at least twice a week, sometimes more. Uh, you know, like uh, when I checked in on Monday morning, it was with a facial recognition. They, wow. You opt in on it and they're, they've done all sorts of things with track. They track your baggage if you want with a wrap. Mm -hmm. They do all sorts of really cool things on board. You know, you can watch uh, everything from CNBC to the Chris Voss show on board. It's awesome. There you go. In fact, you can just call it out now on the uh, Hey G. O O G L E or A L E X A. I can't say it because it will trigger half the office. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> but you can always ask for the podcast. So let's get into the AI part of that first. But how big is the show this year? Is it expanded? Um, how how big is the show this year? Well, we couldn't expand this year because we were landlocked in terms of the amount of space. Yeah. It's pretty much the same size as last year. Um, we don't. Come on, have there's more hotels you guys can take over. Uh, we. <laughs> Well, we're waiting for more hotel rooms to be built, and that's true. Progress. Huh? Plus, you know, next year when we talk, we'll be talking about the 2021 show and the brand new convention center, which hopefully is opening in time for our show. So we'll That'll have more awesome. space and a new facility. It'll be very exciting. We're, we've been working around that for a while, but I think you guys are the ones out. who force them to expand that thing every year. The that we work didn't on the same force and... them, but we did ask, and they did invest like over a billion dollars in this expansion and yeah. new construction. 
Vegas is still the greatest place to have a show, in my opinion. Uh, I always, I always beg the people at South by Southwest to move the show there because Austin, it, they've so much grown out, outgrown Austin. It's awful. So you guys, you guys got a lot of stuff going on the show. You've got some really keynotes. You want to run anybody by us that's keynoting this year? Absolutely. So we have um, the night before the show, we have top people from Samsung and uh, from Mercedes. Uh, that's right before. We also have uh, a bunch of other, uh, I mean, there's so many different people speaking, it's, it's hard to yeah. go through it. Um, you just have Meg, a ton. Of yeah, there, there is a ton. There's definitely a ton. Um, Meg Whitman is, you know, she used to head eBay and now she heads a company that's focused on short form video, which is really, really interesting. Her and Jeffrey Katzenberg will be speaking and keynoting, you know, the, the famous producers. I assume everyone knows who Jeff Katzenberg is. Uh, we got a lot of um, great uh, speakers. We actually are focusing on some big issues like uh, privacy. We have the top privacy officers for Facebook and for Apple mm. speaking along with an FTC commissioner. That's kind of cool. That's going to be uh, interesting. I think I saw the PR thing on the FCC commissioner. Um, you know, what you talked about earlier with going with Delta and facial recognition. And of course, I'm sure that you're probably using AI, uh, from, uh, IBM and stuff. And I'm seeing a lot of that from the press releases that are coming from, uh, CS right now is AI is going to be huge at the show. It's going to be the future, but then privacy, of course, on the other side of that is going to be a huge aspect to balancing that, uh, technology. Absolutely. So artificial uh, intelligence AI is definitely one of the core technologies underlying a lot of what's happening at CES. Uh, it is it's so pervasive. It's kind of like where the Internet of Things was a few years ago. You just, in a way, it's just everyone's going to have it. Um, and there's all sorts of new applications that are coming, which will make our lives better. There is, a, is what's interesting is underlying it is there's a few big issues. One of them is privacy. And then there's this like global competition as to who's going to be the best. And, you know, it's interesting because China said we are, you know, we are, this is one of our major strategies is to be number one in AI. And they graduate a million engineers a year. Uh, and they, crazy. And they you know, they, they have a lot of data and they have one language and they, they have a different concept of privacy that we have. So they're going forward in some ways that probably would be culturally unacceptable to us. Mm hmm and definitely to Europe. I mean, Europe goes. Yeah, there's Europe's cameras all, everywhere in Europe. All about, well, that's an interesting you said that, which is true in some countries. But yeah. on the other hand, they have the, the most developed privacy laws. So you have, you have the right to take down stuff that you don't like about yourself on the Internet. It's called yeah. the right to be forgotten. They have the new privacy law, which is out there, which really makes it tough to develop a lot of things. So at this point, the U.S. is doing it kind of the right way, although it would be nice to have a national law. Yeah. They are... Um, and that's one of the discussions. We have a lot of people from Europe coming to the U.S. I think the fact that we share so much from a human liberty point of view with them in terms of democracy, the right to vote, the right to access the Internet, mm -hmm. the right to uh, practice a religion, the right to marry who you want, all of the, the right to speak, the right to associate, all the things that we just kind of take for granted as Americans are very mm -hmm. consistent with some of the things Europe is doing. And then there's this AI battle going on, which is it's a, it's a very important time to change the world. I've been to Europe several times this year. We've had a lot of discussions. We have a lot of European ministers coming. Plus, we have a lot of the top U.S. government officials coming of all sorts. Uh, and a lot of these issues will be on the table publicly and also in, in terms of discussions. And you guys do a lot of, uh, you guys do a lot of support of different issues. I think charities, stuff like that. Uh, I, I'll see PR things that will come out on different things that you guys are doing that are, um, I'm thinking, trying to miss the word that's off the top of my head, but you know, just a lot of good stuff that you guys do. Yeah, with the thank CPA. you for like that open in an invitation to talk about how wonderful we are. I'll, I'll accept. So, <laughs> so one of the things we announced at the CES stage last year is we're giving $10 million to uh, companies that are started by, or headed by uh, women and um, traditionally underrepresented groups. And the thinking was, and a lot of this is, is definitely evolved over time, is that the, the challenge we're facing in the technology world is a lot of people that look like you and me, and then you know some of the ones who hit it off really well, they, give, they invest money and they give to people that look like them. Are you talking about uh, people that are really hot? No, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> now, balding white guys that are, you know, used to look better. Wait, I'm balding? <laughs> oh, I am. Well, I'm the one who's bald. You're bald. Well, you're, I'm, you're, I'm chasing you. I'm trying to keep up with you. So anyway, the uh, bottom line of it is, and so what we've done is we've, we've said, look, we, we have to give more visibility to these people at CES in terms of what they're doing, whether it's startups or others. We have to attract groups. We've gone out to major companies that have these employee resource groups as ERGs like for like black women or gays or, or whatever. And, we, and they say, we say, could you help 
them come to CES? Can we help? Can we provide scholarships, things like that? Plus we've done, um, and, and the thought is to get different people very, you know, to get them visibility, to get them attuned to the, the CES, which is a big show, and have diversity and inclusiveness, and not just in, in speakers, but in people who attend, and in what we do, in funding companies, so every step of the way. So we start, actually, as our philosophy as an organization, we start out when they're kids. We support boys and girls clubs, because they do a lot in terms of computer training, science training, things like that, and they, you know, they're often with underprivileged kids, and it's a really phenomenal program. And then we we go up to various competitions. We do it uh, for uh, for veterans. We have a whole separate thing. We're helping veterans get jobs. That's awesome. We do. Uh, we've announced on the IBM with IBM last January, Ginny Rometty, that we would have apprenticeships, which is a really non traditional way of people becoming skilled. But it's not very popular in this country, outside of uh, you know some some um, more skilled labor type jobs. This is for. IT type jobs and others we're trying to expand it into and jobs that require technology skills. And we've also worked to, uh, with the White House to get volunteers from industry to step up and say, we're gonna train people within companies or hire people and reskill them for jobs that are future jobs, the jobs we know we'll need people for like data analysts, various types of programming, things like that, self-driving cars. And that's, um, that's the most phenomenally successful program there is in my view, because over 14 million jobs have been committed by our industry and other industries. I think our industry is good. Our members are for 4 million jobs. That's American jobs. That's taking people who don't have the skills today and giving them new skills. And that's a pretty big, strong commitment. And I, and it really came out of something I wanted to talk to you about because you mentioned that I had my book uh, launched in 2019 at CES. Well, because as a result of that, where I, all I talked about is the future of technology and how great it is, blah, blah, blah. Well, the truth is Ivanka Trump, uh, I met with her in the White House and she said, that's all nice, but what are you gonna do about all these people that are put out of jobs? And she started this program on her own. She inspired me to go out to my board who endorsed the program immediately. Uh, it's, it's gotten Democratic support, Republican support, everyone saying, look, government just can't do everything. Business has to step up. So our industry, our business has stepped up and we're doing this uh, reskilling and training, which is really, really important. So. As a result, my, my book I have coming out in paperback now in January, and I've added a new chapter that talks about this whole aspect of jobs, because people, let's face it, around the country, are, and even around the world, are on, you know, we are encouraged by new technology, we like it, but a lot of people, the average person may be uncomfortable with it, because it's changing everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're putting truck drivers <laughs> out of work, and cab drivers, and all sorts of people who work in factories, and you're putting everyone out of work, in a sense, based on old jobs and old skills, that's a scary thought for people. It definitely is. And let's, let's give a uh, plug to your book. You guys can go to amazon.com. Uh, Gary is the author of three books there, Ninja Future, The Comeback, and Ninja Innovation. You can check out his book. And, of course, uh, you can check out the podcast from last year where he plugged his book and talked in depth about it. Uh, but, yeah, we, for 10 years, you've probably seen this between me and a lot of uh, tech people. We've been talking about this whole sort of you that we're going to have to go through with retooling these people's education, people that are in some of these old steel factory farms or uh, steel factory areas. Of course, farms are yeah, going high tech too. But we just recently saw Ford is going to invest in 3,000 new high tech jobs, I believe, for automated cars in Detroit. So, you know, seeing some rebound with the Detroit to thing there. Uh, and you, you bring up a, a couple of things I want to cover too. You brought up a good point about uh, investing in youth, investing in other people. You know, the older I get, the more I want someone to solve cancer and solve the health problems that you and I are both going to have to deal with as we get older and they become more prevalent. So and the one thing I learned about owning, with owning companies was uh, you, you, no one has all the ideas. No one has all the ideas. I certainly learned that as CEO because I, I would sit and look at my team and go, like, here's my idea, but please tell me why it's wrong because I don't want to do it if it's wrong and you know we're going to lose you know the business over it. Um, no one has the monopoly on all the ideas. <clears throat> so if someone from the youth, someone from any walk of life can come to this country or anywhere in the world actually and create something that's innovative, that solves cancer, that makes our lives better. Hey, I'm all for it, man. Please solve cancer. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it's great that you guys are investing in that. Um, what was interesting is, uh, we did a lot of robotics interviews on this show and my other podcast, uh, spatial computing, which talks about AI and, and stuff like that. 
And what's interesting is we found that uh, uh, these new robotic things that they, they can uh, have don't require a lot of engineering and schooling to take and do, and they can retool a lot of people into doing them, uh, which is pretty amazing, which gets us through the curve. They can actually just take normal people and put them through a small class and teach them uh, basic robotics to operate some of these uh, uh, smaller robots that can uh, work in small and medium-sized businesses. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, you're right. Things are changing rapidly, and sometimes it shouldn't be as scary as it is, but it's definitely scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to adjust as a country, as a culture. There is the technology is going to solve fundamental human problems. And when you talk about um, the, what, what's going on with, with uh, medicine, for example, that's where this, I mean, it's the fastest growing area of CES, frankly, is health. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, it has to grow fast because, you know, there's a law that actually limits the number of doctors in this country. Oh, wow. Yeah, since 1996, it's had to do with funding of residents. residents wow. and, uh, but yet the population is expanding rapidly. Yeah. And especially at the older segment, which needs more healthcare service. I, on a Thursday night, I was picking my son up from school and I ran into an old, well, not an old friend. He's actually a younger friend, but he's an oncologist. And I asked him how it's going. He said, terrible. And he said, why? He says, I, I can't keep up with the number of patients I have. There's just wow. not enough oncologists in this country to serve yeah. the needs of people with cancer. And like, so what do you tell? I mean, you can't tell people to just wait. Yeah, he had bags under his eyes. I swear he's he's aged ten years in the last two years, and it's just it's getting a lot worse before it gets better. So our thinking in part is, and maybe not just in cancer, but in other areas, is that technology actually does provide some of the answer. In that, first of all, it, to the extent you can do remote monitoring, someone mm -hmm. doesn't have to go to a doctor. You could set up the algorithm so a doctor is alerted if certain criteria are met, um, and then you know combine that with the machine learning, you could figure out what actually works. Technology can be used also as a treatment. There's all sorts of treatments now for pain, mm -hmm. which are technology-based rather than drug-based or surgery-based. There's something called focused ultrasound, which actually is an outpatient procedure, which is an alternative for many uh, cancers to the surgery or chemotherapy. So you have all these things happening very quickly in the world of technology, which I think are very positive that will help solve the problem. But there is still an issue, which I think you raise, is that, you know, you really want smart people to come to your country and help. And that's um, clearly uh, the, the fervor in the country. In fact, in the world is not to encourage immigration anymore. It's, it seems to be heading the other direction. Yeah. And, and like I say, no one has a monopoly on ideas. I always, I always say what, uh, you know, uh, the father of Steve Jobs was an immigrant and he came to this country seeking a better life. And I always am like, can you imagine what this world would be like if Steve Jobs hadn't invented the uh, iPhone? Um I mean, yeah, yeah, I think my job today is based on that. Of course, the other side of the story, which is very tragic, is that Steve Jobs, when he found out who his father was, that he ran this restaurant oh, that he right. could go to every week, he actually never went back there again, never talked to his father. I mean, that's just a sad human relations story that has nothing to do with anything other than yeah. Steve Jobs was certainly brilliant in, in, in a whole bunch of ways and deserves to be a hero, but he wasn't a wonderful human being. Some of my close friends uh, worked for him and helped develop the iPhone. My, my one friend, Andy Gig. Grignon has a lot of stories. You may have seen him tell oh, stories in the thing. Oh, Andy's a friend of mine as well. Yeah, Andy has yeah. great stories. <laughs> yeah, and he has some <laughs> wonderful the F, stories. Putting the real... F word on his card. Business yeah, card. the yeah the uh, uh, it, it's just great stories. In fact, I I met him when he was kind of coming out of the bubble, and he would tell us the stories, and we're like, you got to tell some people this. And now he's been on movies and stuff, but right. yeah, it's. It's, uh, you know, Steve Jobs is, I, you've probably seen this in your career of, of seeing so many different CEOs and I I saw it and I may have been guilty of a little bit of it, but there, there are some that have this huge creative ability, but they also have this destructive side. And sometimes it's really, their destructive side is running right behind them. It's kind of like a Tucson, you're an avalanche and you're like, how do they survive? <laughs> no, you, you make a great point. To be a great leader, sometimes you have to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your human skills aren't exactly what they should be. And especially in the technology industry, where a lot of people come from engineering, like a lot of people, including some current, very well-known famous uh, tech starters of big companies, they're, um, you know, there's a, there's a, their social skills aren't the best. Their emotional intelligence is good. Some of the, the tech leaders actually are, um, some of them have come out very, very, very young. Mm -hmm. and they haven't developed the maturity. Uh, and I compare that with Israel where, every tech executive served in the Israeli military for at least two years and managed yeah. people and big equipment and they dealt with death around them and the threat of death. And they're just much, they don't have the, the problems that we have of maturity that we definitely have in the United States. And the other thing is, is that 
you know, we did a panel in France last month and it focused on, um, and one of the things we did at this French little CES we had there was a panel that I wasn't really focused on diversity. And, and there's this woman moderating, there's three women speaking. And then on the bar end of the panel, there's this guy, this white guy up there. And they, these three president engineers who started companies in France, they spoke very eloquently about the challenges of being a woman, an engineer and a CEO. And like, I'm thinking the guy at the end, like what could he possibly be other than gay? And I was so wrong because he, he said, I have Asperger's syndrome. Oh, wow. You have to deal with me differently. And he's very flat in his effect. And he basically said, if you look at Silicon Valley and other places, there's a lot of people like me. Yeah. So kind of interesting. So just because you're brilliant in starting a company doesn't mean you're brilliant in terms of your ability to deal with humans, ability to deal with different types of students. You mentioned also the, uh, which I thought was really important, I don't want to lose the point, of you can't do everything by yourself as a company anymore. And that's what CES has become. Every company is a tech company, but every CEO has realized they can't do anything alone. So they have to partner with other tech companies, they have to partner with other companies, they have to work outside the vertical. In fact, I, I think having talked to a whole bunch of CEOs on, about this, that the value now in terms of becoming a CEO of a big company that maybe you didn't start yourself is really your ability to cut across vertical lines, cut deals, deal with people of different cultures, be able to get to yes, uh, have win-win situations, see the potential, innovate. And that's what CS is also is you're, you're, it's all about innovation. A lot of the innovation comes from putting two things together that weren't together before. Mm -hmm. And that's the ability to see that and be inspired. I mean, CES is, is from afar, it looks like a fun, interesting trade show, but when you're there as you have been, you know, there's nothing like the value of walking down the halls or going to press conferences or the serendipity of discovery in Eureka Park yeah. where we have 1,200 startups. It's just inspiring. And that's, it's, it's hard to convey that, but the inspirational nature of CES is so important. And you see stuff from all over the world, too. So you see stuff that's cutting edge. You see stuff that uh, maybe has been redone 50,000 times, but in a new way that's kind of interesting. We're like, wow, I never looked at it from that angle. Um, it's, such a, it's such an amazing show for me to go to every year, except for The Walking. <laughs> I think yeah. I might give me a rascal this year. <laughs> Just that's a great point. We, rascal. We had, we had an all-staff meeting. We went to all the things uh, earlier today. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'd say about one quarter or one fifth of our employees have never been to CS before. And the oh, wow. guy raised his hand at the question and answer said, I've never been to CS before. He says, what advice would you give me? And I said, don't buy new shoes right <laughs> back before you go to the show. Bring good <laughs> walking shoes. We have our big Facebook group that's growing larger this yeah. year for CS. And, and everyone is, that's the first thing. And everyone's like, what should I bring? And you're like, good walking shoes. Well, yeah. And the other thing is that, you know, a building may look close in Las Vegas, <laughs> but trust me, it's not. It's I, not. I, I, no. I spent an hour walking between hotels there. It just doesn't. It's it's an amazing place. The, the sense of proportion isn't like any city in the world. Well, I can. I kind of have to thank you, and my body probably thanks you because for the last week or so, or two weeks, I've been getting on the. Tre Let's just say it's a week. Uh, I've been getting on the treadmill, trying to do an hour's worth of work because I'm like, we got to get ready for the marathon, the CES marathon. Good for you. So, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, what's the downside? I mean, you're gonna get, you're gonna get healthy because of you. I hate you, Rob. No, I'm just I will, I'll take your spot. I was just saying how great you look, and I don't think I have anything to do with it. But, you know, everyone makes their own decisions in life and how they treat their body. My theory of life is you got to moderate everything, and, and you got to get the sleep, the food, the spiritual, the healthy lifestyle, and, and, and have a good time as well. It definitely is, and it's just amazing. So uh, let me put you on the spot. What's your favorite thing at CES? I don't want you to alienate everybody else. You know, I'm not going to lie, honestly. <laughs> it's Eureka Park. I mean, there's these startups, and there's these people mm -hmm. with such hope and drive and passion and great ideas, and, and, and they have the CES experience, and every one of them is transformed by the end of it because they know they get feedback from people like you and, and like Mark Cuban walks around and media walks around and investors walk around and Walmart's there and Shark Tank's doing auditions. And, and, they, and they just come up with a new business model because they're doing what they should be doing as a startup because they're getting a lot of feedback before they start going into production. And, and I love and Eureka Park that. because you, you can meet a lot of small to medium-sized businesses, people that are trying to make a difference in the world and probably the future Googles, the future Microsofts and stuff. And, you know, it gives them an affordable way. You know, not everyone can be like, you know, Samsung and Sony and, you know, come in and build these million-dollar sets in, in, uh, in the huge space. But we love those as well, by the way. <laughs> we do. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, going into the Sony or Samsung or LG or like last year, Google, like they just blew everyone away. They, they literally poured tons of concrete in the parking lot and built a, a, a monorail system that yeah. you 
toured the whole Google thing and they got talked about Google Trends. And it was like, I just can't wait to, see. I have no idea what they're doing, but I, I'm looking forward to actually to seeing what they're doing. Cause they, you know, everyone, when you do something great, the problem is everyone wants you to top it. And plug for Eureka Park. If you go to the CS show, go to, I believe it's still in the basement of the sands. Um, go tour Eureka Park and uh, you're going to see a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of innovative stuff. Sometimes you'll see some stuff that's like, you're like, okay. Um, but uh, no, it's a, it's a great show and there's just so much to do. Every year I go to the show and I go, I'm going to see every booth and I'm going to see everything. You can't see every booth. There's 4,500 booths, Chris. I don't know what the, that would, that would be what, a minute per booth? Maybe right. most. Actually, I'm not even right. That doesn't cover it. That doesn't even begin to cover it. Yeah, me. that would. No, you'd have to be like, 16 seconds a booth or something yeah. so that's not going to happen that's why people rely on people like you to say what happened there you know what i should do i should hire a crew to go around and just film everything for me and then after cs you can go watch it <laughs> sometimes i feel that way because i really don't get to see a lot of the show unless i'm taking a dignitary somewhere and we're just like i'm usually more focused on talking to the dignitary and trying mm-hmm. to get to where we're going uh, but, and also, you know, we, we are responsible for 170,000 yeah. people and one third of them are from outside the United States and 6,000 journalists. And it's just, you know, we estimate about 20,000 products are introduced to see us. It's just a very, very exciting time. But the thing that's really cool and changed about this year, mm-hmm. you know, which we wouldn't have talked about five years ago is that the show is focused more and more on different types of tech companies. Like we have the Weber grill company, we have John Deere showing off new tractors. We got Delta, now they, they've also taken out exhibit space in addition to speaking. Uh, all these, you know, P&G is there, Unilever is there. All these companies at the CEO level are coming or they're taking exhibits or doing really amazing things. So it's like the companies, are, the CEOs have figured out that they, they have to be up with technology because everyone, the human nature is to take the picture you're in and say, oh, this is the way things are. Wow, this is a really extraordinary time we live in. And the reality is we're always heading towards an even more extraordinary time. Yeah. And you can't just look at your competition and say, that's my competition. I'm ahead of them today. Well, look, the competition is thinking about what they, how they could beat you. Yeah. So you have to keep moving fast <laughs> just to stay ahead of your competition because everyone is, it's a pretty brutal world of global yeah. competition, but that's making everyone better. And if you think about what's happening with self-driving, with medicine, with uh, other forms of transportation, with water, clean water, clean air, with education and entertainment, we're getting better and better at all this stuff. And there's yeah. always new things coming. And it's, uh, it, it means we'll be living longer, we'll be having safer lives, we'll be getting around. You know, if you just look at self-driving, what that will do for people that are older or people that are disabled. Uh, yeah. try to get their kids around it, 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 it's just going to change life the quality of life yeah i mean i the one mantra i always had in our businesses is, is there's always a way to improve something infinitely like it never there's always a as soon as you make an innovation okay great what's next um and there's always a way to improve things and make them better Absolutely. and better and better uh one of my favorite stories i tell it's not that great of a story but you know i remember looking at paper clips and being like okay that's done there's, there's paper clips. And then I started seeing an office max, you know, serrated paper clips to hold the paper better, uh, painted ones. So you could personalize them. Oh my God. Like I was like, who needs personalized paper clips, but people do. And <laughs> there's just always a way to make something better. I mean, whatever it is, there's probably a way to make me better, but, uh, uh, we're Chris, still you're talking. Perfect that. You're just perfect as oh, you I are. You, and man. I, I, I'm glad you're coming to see us. Can I bring you to my psychologist uh, appointments to, so that you can argue with? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, we have to keep the economy going. That's why we need to come. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris, for uh, covering CES and for spending the, taking the time to talk to me. All right. I appreciate it, man. I love you, bud. Thanks for being friends with me. And, right. no, uh, I appreciate it. I love the way crap. you look, and I love that you're getting healthy and healthier every day. You're, man, you have the secret of a uh, fountain of youth you've discovered. Wait till you see me after the CS marathon walk. That's I, what, got it. I got it. There, is there a ribbon or prize I get at the end, like a thing I can cross if I live? Uh, I'll send you one if you remind me. Take <laughs> care. Right, Chris. Well, thanks right. for coming to the show. Be sure to check out Gary Shapiro. Go to amazon.com. Check out his wonderful books. Get the new paper book that's coming out. And uh, check out, uh, it's ces.com, csshow.com? ces.tech cs.tech ech there you go go to the show if you can get a chance or if you belong to the association or if you're press or whatever otherwise check it out and watch it online you can see it on twitter as well you can follow the cs pound hashtag thanks to gary for being on the show have a great show buddy as they say happy holidays safe travels all right take care bye now